this lecture will look at Constantinople III uh, in the main and uh, touch upon some points that come out of uh, a local synod in Toledo, um, Spain in the year 688, a few years after the close of Constantinople III. And we'll discover that uh, in terms of the doctrines promulgated, uh, there's basically a repetition of Lateran 649, although uh, the council itself is relatively silent, almost totally silent uh, with respect to Lateran 649, Maximus or Pope Martin. Um, <clears throat> but we'll see that um, the main themes, the main conclusions uh, from Lateran 649 are applied and promulgated universally in the Imperium or Empire uh, by Constantinople III and uh, the equilibrium, uh, relatively speaking, between Rome and Constantinople was reestablished, and um, Constantinople III thereby takes on uh, ecumenical status as the sixth ecumenical council, which condemns uh, monothelitism or, and um, also uh, carries within it uh, an important distinction, namely the distinction between essence and energy that becomes ulteriorly developed in later theologians in the 14th century, especially by Palamas and his followers with respect to the uncreated, uh, incomprehensible and ineffable essence of God versus uh, his uncreated energies by which and through which he manifests um, his nature in a limited way, uh, which for Palamas is ultimately imparticipable and incomprehensible. But nevertheless, uh, through his uncreated energies, manifests um, his power and benevolence, etc., um, in creation through these uncreated energies, uh, in concert with the created energies uh, operating uh, on the basis of created natures and properties. And so we'll find that this distinction between essence or nature and energy or operation is foundational for the subsequent development of Polemite uh, theology of the God at Intra, as well as the mission of the Holy Spirit and the process of theosis um, at Extra, as well as um, parallel um, but distinct developments in the Franciscan school, uh, beginning with uh, Bonaventrix, especially um, with his uh, na nascent or inchoate use of the so-called formal distinction, and then fully explicit in a figure like John Duns Scotus, with uh, his explicit development and application of his formal distinction. Uh, these latter subjects we will develop further in the next lecture. But suffice it to say that coming out of um, the seventh century with the theology of Maximus the Diothelite, Dioenergist theology of Maximus, Lateran 649, and then vindicated in the Diothelite doctrines um, from the Ecumenical Council, Constantinople III, we see uh, a metaphysical commitment implied and enforced that um, created or set the stage for uh, an ulterior or different application of the same kind of distinction with respect to God himself in the essence energies distinction that Polymas develops and employs. So briefly, uh, the historical background is by the 670s, 678, um, it's clear that relatively speaking, good relationships have been, a, good relations have been established or reestablished between Rome and Constantinople. Um, this is demonstrated at least in part by the letter that the Emperor Constantine IV sent to Pope Donus uh, requesting that uh, 12 bishops and four Western Greek monastic superiors come to Constantinople in order to represent Rome in a council that the Emperor was planning to convene and execute um, <clears throat> for the purpose of the condemnation of monothelitism. Uh, it wasn't Pope Donus who actually received the letter, he had already passed on, um, it was Pope Agatho uh, who received the letter, and Pope Agatho uh, agreed to not only send representatives, but held his own synod um, to gather information and consensus about this, the issue of monothelitism in the West. And he convened uh, a local synod uh, around the time of Easter in the year 680 in Rome, where at um, 125 bishops 
from Italy, basically, got together and condemned monothelitism and composed their own profession of faith, which we will see uh, will be read at the Council of Constantinople III itself. Uh, the legates are then sent and they arrive in Constantinople uh, in September of 680, and already on the 10th of September, the council began. Uh, the council comprises 18 sessions, 11 of which were presided over directly by the emperor, and um, important for uh, dogmatic purposes, rather than give an entire account of this, the, each session, um, because in fact, uh, the more theologically profound synod on this topic was Lateran 649, um, we can just briefly note that in the eighth session, we find the condemnation of monothelitism. In the 13th, we find uh, the condemnation of the heretics uh, named in Lateran 649, as well as the addition of the name of Honorius and um, Peter of Constantinople. Um, and then in the 17th and 18th sessions, we find the doctrines uh, of, of the council laid out um, in concluding the council on the 16th of September, 681. So just about a year it took to uh, complete all 18 sessions. Um, 164 bishops total signed the acts of the council, signed the doctrinal statement of the council, the 18th session, and the emperor himself signed this. Uh, subsequently, Pope Leo II, uh, who reigned from 682 to 683, approved the council and then had it translated into Latin uh, approving the council in toto, uh, thus by implication, um, uh, the condemnation of Honorius for a certain dereliction of duty with respect to guarding the faith against the errors, which the council itself perceived as um, equivalent to monophysitism of Apollinarius, uh, Severus, and Themistius um, because of his weakness in being vigilant and upholding the doctrine. Um, Honorius was condemned as holding the monothelite position, and um, Pope Leo II approved this condemnation, as well as the rest of the acts and doctrines of the council. So let's turn to the documents. I, this lecture will be relatively short. Uh, we don't need to spend much time on this dur during this lecture, because many of the main points have already been laid out. Um, but briefly, we'll go to um, a consideration of Agatho's letter to the emperor in response to uh, the emperor's letter to Pope Domus. Um, the letter dates to March 27th, uh, 680, and we find, uh, and these are all uh, given according to the Denziger numbers, that in the letter Pope Agatho affirms the natural properties of both of Christ's nature, natures, uh, they were without confusion, separation, and immutably united. Immutably doesn't uh, directly touch upon the metaphysical question of the absolute possibility or impossibility of separability, but with the fact that de facto God wills through his immutable will to enter into an inseparable union without confusion um, in the person of the word who possesses upon the moment of the incarnation in the hypostatic union two natures everlastingly, one eternal and divine, the other one created and human. Interestingly, um, this text also repeats the catchphrase of, which we've seen before, of the Cyrillians and the Neo-Chalcedonians, that the distinction between the two natures is only discerned uh, by the intelligence. It doesn't yet, and it doesn't really get to the nature of that distinction, how the intellect uh, distinguishes between these two, or upon what basis are the two natures distinct. Uh, it's taken simply as granted that both natures are preserved um, in their fullness, in their perfection, and that thereby all the properties um, and powers and energies or operations of both of those natures are also preserved without confusion or separation. The reason I raise the issue of the distinction is that it appears again in the synodal letter from Rome to the emperors uh, that shortly follows Agatha's own letter, and um, this distinction will be further fleshed out um, in the next lecture in terms of the basis of that distinction, and it will pertain to the question of the essence energies distinction, uh, and ulteriorly, or in a parallel manner, to the nature of the formal distinction as, as it is developed through Bonaventure and reach, reaches a certain conceptual and terminological uh, clarity and perfection in SCOTUS. Um, <clears throat> so moving on then, 
Uh, in Denzinger 544, we find in Agatha's letter that uh, Christ has two natures, two wills, and two energies. Um, interestingly here, and this will become more come more to the fore in the subsequent essence energies dis discussion with respect to God ad intra, um, that not only does it distinguish the two natures, it distinguishes within the human nature and by implication um, within the divine nature, the distinction between nature and will and will and energy. So thus within a nature, there's a distinction then between nature and will and nature and energy or nature and its powers or properties and the power and properties distinction from the energetic manifestation or operation of those properties uh, rooted in and flowing out of the will itself or the nature itself, excuse me. Um, and of course, uh, Christ and his two natures are not contrary and his two wills especially are not contrary to one another, the two wills that is, nor are they confused. Um, and going on to explain this a bit further, Agatha writes that each nature is perfect, um, echoing uh, a strong Maximian theme that we saw earlier, that each, each nature is perfect and undiminished. And thus will is not a person term or, or a person property um, considered uh, qua person. Because if that were the case, if um, will is attributable in the first sense to person rather than the person's nature, um, then if we look at the counterfactual situation with respect to the Trinity, if the person of the word has a will and the will is derived or founded in on founded upon the nature of person or hypostasis as such, then with respect to the Trinity, then we would have three personal wills and thus seemingly uh, three gods. So in this sense, then the whole discussion over the distinction between nature and person, nature and hypostasis, hypostasis it comes to the fore and is further developed because um, without that distinction, you would end up with three wills in the Godhead because there are three persons if you were to, to attribute in the proper sense the power of will or, or um, the energetic action of willing to the person qua person rather than the person qua possessing a given nature. And thus, um, Agatho uh, asserts quite rightly that will then is a nature term. It refers to a property of nature. And then, of course, the person possesses that nature. Um, but that is a different question. And so here we find a clear distinction and development of the, of the importance of um, keeping a proper understanding of the difference between nature and person. Otherwise, we fall into uh, various forms of errors. Uh, could be monophysitism, could be tritheism. Um, it could simply be a denial of the divinity of Christ um, by reducing um, his human reality, a la Nestorius, to um, a hypostasis, and a hypostasis with possession of a will um, that is somehow unique or proper to the hypostasis as such, thus implying two distinct hypostases. Um, so you can see Agathos dealing with some subtle concepts here and refining the language and the, and the concepts and developing that language and concepts in terms of the distinction between natures and persons, then natures and wills, and natures and wills and energies. These same basic ideas are, are represented in the synodal letter coming from the 125 bishops at the Easter Synod. Um, interestingly, we find that the, the, the document or the text uses both the from to and into uh, formulation so common to Neo-Chalcedonian terminology, um, thereby integrating the Cyrillian uh, linguistic system uh, into the more strict Chalcedonian language of one person into natures, now it's acceptable with the proper caveats that from to doesn't imply prior existence of at least the human nature, um, and thus by implication, independent um, activity on the part of the human nature prior to the union. Um, rather, it's just a simply an assertion that the one composite hypostasis possessing two natures actually is compounded qua hypostasis from those two natures, divine and human. It doesn't have to do with um, 
the prior existence or independent existence of the human nature of Christ. So we find Neo-Chalcedonian terminology enshrined and accepted broadly both East and West with respect to the from to Cyrillian formula and the into uh, Chalcedonian formula. Um, we also find in Rome's synodal letter the assertion and clear acceptance of the both the difference of natures as well as the uh, perfect unity in the hypostasis with respect to Christ, difference between divine and human um, and union of divine and human in the hypostasis of the word. And then we find again uh, the assertion that the difference, however, between the humanity and the divinity of Christ is discernible only in or by uh, contemplation. Um, here, contemplation versus um, intelligence, intelligentsia versus contemplazione um, <clears throat> is uh, really just a stylistic difference. The point is, is that um, only the spiritual or rational mind is able to discern the difference, it's not something that is uh, manifest in terms of countable items that are um, able to be materially distinguished and then set apart or set side by side um, in a kind of relation of op opposition or a relation of difference. Um, it's, it's not to be considered in terms of one being outside of another being, thereby we count the differences. It's not um, two oranges or an orange and an apple set side by side, rather the difference because of the ineffable union and the inexistence of the divinity and humanity through the hypostatic union, and then the further actions of uh, deification, the difference between humanity and divinity are discernible and thus counter countable or uh, enumerated uh, through reason. Um, again, however, this doesn't, this is not to imply that reason creates the distinction. It, it doesn't directly answer that question that question will have to later be later um, dealt with more carefully and clearly um, by subsequent theologians. However, it just simply states that the difference is something discernible to reason alone, by uh, discernible by rational um, agents or rational persons, um, not something that is just physically manifest or apparent. Uh, you know, such as when, um, say, a dog has dog food and a bowl of dog food and a bowl of his water, um, the dog discerns two bowls um, as two distinct items, attracting him uh, in terms of various dispositions and needs. Um, nevertheless, um, the dog doesn't perceive the, the number qua number or the distinction qua, dis qua distinction. Nevertheless, there is some physically manifestable distinction uh, that is able to be discerned on a purely um, sub-rational level. It doesn't take rationality in the dog to discern the difference between his bowl of dog food and his bowl of water. Um, the, the difference here being spoken of by the synodal letter and by Pope Agatho and by previous theologians, um, again this distinction coming from Cyril and the Cyrillian school, is that this is something that only a reasonable agent or a rational agent is able to perceive. <clears throat> Also, the properties of each nature is preserved. Um, the synodal letter then quotes Leo, uh, Leo's letter to Flavian, and then provides us with a, a kind of syllogism that follows closely along uh, Lateran 649's reasoning um, based upon the Council of Chalcedon and exemplified in the writings and reasonings of Maximus the Confessor. In short, if there are two natures, divine and human, then there must be two wills and two operations. Two wills because will is a property of nature, an essential property of a rational nature, and operations or energies um, because energies are correlative to wills or to properties as rendering those properties actually real and operational. And so um, Agatho and the Roman Synod is simply drawing out, are simply drawing out the implications of Chalcedon and by, um, even if unstated, um, following the reasonings of Maximus the Confessor and uh, Lateran 649. <clears throat> now we get to Constantinople III itself, again, which was held uh, between September of 680 and September of 681. We find in session 13, the condemnation of all the old names, um, Theodore of Ferran, Sergius, Pyrrhus, 
um, Paul of Constantinople, as well as now the inclusion of Honorius of Rome and Peter of Constantinople. Um, and um, this, again, this condemnation, along with the entirety of the Acts and the doctrinal conclusions of the Council were accepted by Pope Leo and promulgated in Latin uh, by Pope Leo II. Um, moving quickly to, or rapidly through, um, the dogmatic section of the Council, um, because the Council itself didn't really deal with uh, disciplinary aspects of the Church, um, rather focused directly and exclusively on the question of the condemnation of monothelitism. Um, <clears throat> in terms of accepting authorities, uh, in session 18 we find that um, the Council accepts the letters of Agatho and the letter from the letter of Agatho and the letter from the Roman Synod um, in terms of their doctrinal content and actually uh, has them read out. Uh, the council also accepts the um, letters of Cyril against Nestorius. And then moving down into uh, the later sections uh, here, according to Denzinger number 555, we find a clear affirmation of the two natures of Christ, which then are developed by implication, this teaching, in the two natures doctrine, ramifying into the two wills via properties, distinct properties, and energies uh, via the exercise and actuation of those properties in reality. And I will just quote um, the two natures passage from Constantinople itself. <clears throat> So the, the, the number 555 reads, he was begotten before the ages from the father as regards his divinity. And in the last days, the same for us and for our salvation from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was properly and truly called mother of God as regards his humanity. One and the same Christ, son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures that undergo no confusion, no change, no separation, no division. At no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together in a single person and hypostasis. Uh, basically, this is uh, re recapitulating and summarizing the contents of um, Nicaea I, um, the First Council of Constantinople, Ephesus and Chalcedon. And then in the subsequent section, Denziger of 556, we find a clearer uh, pronounce it with respect to the two natures, uh, our two wills and two energies or powers. And this is the uh, distinction that will become important for Palamas and also uh, in a parallel way with uh, Western theologians who are the recipients of uh, the Damascenes de Fide Orthodoxa. We find in 556 then, quote, we likewise proclaim in him, according to the teachings of the Father, two natural volitions or wills and two natural actions. And here uh, the Greek reads, duo physikas energeas. So the two natural actions uh, refer to those two distinct natural energies. <clears throat> and of course, these wills and energies are without division, without change, without separation, and without confusion. Here the, the council also wants to affirm that unlike the monothelite inference of two opposed wills, uh, the wills are not, quote here, by any means opposed to each other, um, but his human will is compliant. So here there's an expression of order. There's an order between the wills. Um, the human will, although energetically operating in terms of its own proper form or nature and property, namely will, um, is nevertheless submissive to the divine will, the divine will that Christ possesses as a person in common with the Father and the Spirit. So there is an order and hierarchy uh, within Christ with respect to the, his human will and his divine will, but it doesn't render his human will simply uh, inactive or um, actuated uh, in terms of efficient or formal causality uh, 
by the divine will as such. <clears throat> And um, I won't touch upon it, but there's kind of a definitive exegesis of John 6.38, where Christ says, I come not to do uh, my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Um, here, uh, quoting Athanasius, and later on, uh, Gregory the theologian, um, the clarification is made that when he's speaking of I, when Christ is speaking in the I here, he's referring to his human will. Um, because, again, as uh, Maximus himself points out in uh, the, uh, the Opusculum 7 that we have already read uh, in class, um, if the I in this situation was not in reference to the natural human will, um, then there would be an absurdity of Christ saying, I in my divine will, which is identical to the Father, have come not to do my will, but his will, uh, so, grammatically and logically and metaphysically absurd um, on every point. The council then further goes on to clarify in uh, number 557 in session, uh, found in session 18 or from session 18, that uh, the two energies uh, doctrine is reaffirmed and the Tome of Leo is quoted, um, specifically that notion of each proper form maintains its own proper activity. And then the theological commentary, bringing this all together, is the recognition in number 558 that in Christ his two natures shine forth as an instrument or a medium, as a kind of um, created semiotic of the divinity. The two natures shine forth through the flesh, that is, through the humanity as such. Um, the miracles that Christ works through his humanity um, are signs and indicative of his divinity and his suffering is a clear sign of his humanity. However, it's one person, one hypostasis, one eternal divine hypostasis operating in and through two natural energies, one divine, one human. And the two wills, getting back to that question of non-opposition between the wills, the two wills uh, concur in an orderly manner that the human uh, submitting freely to the divine in the one person of Christ for uh, salvation. And so basically what we find in Constantinople III is the ecumenical reception and summation without naming it of uh, Lateran 649. And if you want the <clears throat> a fuller uh, theological and um, patristic account in terms of Florilegia, um, Lateran 649 provides that as well as the um, outstanding theological argumentation that Maximus provides in his own writings, but also that he provides through ghost writing, uh, Lateran 649. And then we get to Toledo, uh, the 15th Council or Synod of Toledo 688. Um, this is important historically because it indicates the uh, universality of the rejection and the acceptance of the rejection of monothelitism in and through um, or coming out of Constantinople III. Uh, we find also, in relation, but slightly preceding Constantinople III, the Synod of Hatfield in England, wherein monothelitism is rejected uh, under the presidency of Theodore of Tarsus, Theodore of Canterbury. Um, <clears throat> also, there was an important uh, confusion that arose over um, the previous, or the Archbishop of Toledo's use of the notion of will proceeding from will, um, according to his papal critic, that sounded like um, we're, again, separating um, nature from will and understanding the will as producing something else. And thus, by implication, if will can produce will, why can't will produce understanding and memory? Um, here, the, the, the response of Toledo uh, 688 is that um, in God, we can speak in common because of his simplicity as God's willing be equal to his understanding and memory um, because by dint of the ontological simplicity of the divine nature. However, with respect to humanity, there's clearly an order or a taxis. You cannot say that uh, mind or, or memory or intellect proceeds from will. Rather, 
Um, intellect proceeds from memory, and will proceeds from memory through intellect um, and terminates in volitional action. Uh, the language is confused, but the point here is um, there's, there was still ongoing talk about the implications of the distinction of properties and nature, both in humanity and in the divinity itself, that will need to be further fleshed out. Um, with respect to the divinity, um, there's a kind of simultaneity and um, uh, reversibility uh, with respect to properties, uh, will, uh, then memory, memory, then will, um, and on an ontological level, this approach is certainly correct, but in terms of a logical or notional level, um, in terms of what presumes what, um, this language is still confusing, confusing because clearly even in God, he certainly cannot will something without knowing this. In this sense, then, uh, will as an energy that is in some meaningfully way distinct from the, um, or property rather, uh, distinct from the power or property of volition or intellect um, needs to be maintained because one cannot will what one uh, does not first know. Uh, <clears throat> and so this language of the logical ordering of divine acts and the manner in which divine acts need to be distinguished from one another, uh, divine powers and energies, that is, um, need to be distinguished from one another, even um, with respect to God at intra, uh, will arise and need to be further fleshed out. However, the common assumption that God is not composed out of his parts, which is what um, the simplicity of God is really getting at, um, is affirmed, and uh, the further theological clarification and development awaits a later date, um, and in, in fact, really becomes uh, most clearly discussed in later last Latin scholasticism. Another interesting uh, controversy that arose was the assertion of uh, three substances in Christ. Um, this, the Synod of Toledo doesn't go back on uh, asserting three substances, understanding substance uh, in, an, in an analogical or perhaps even equivocal way. Uh, clearly, in terms of his divinity, Christ is one substance. In terms of his humanity, also as a whole uh, being or a complete being, he's only one substance or res. However, um, within that res, there is two further, according to this reasoning, and Bonaventure follows this reasoning explicitly in his uh, disputed questions on the mystery of the Trinity. Um, in terms of this reading, there are further sub, uh, sub-substances, uh, we could call them partial or incomplete substances, that together uh, form a new incomplete substances. Naturally or obviously, the incomplete substances in the humanity of Christ are his soul and his body. Um, <clears throat> both unique um, and proper principles of operation that come together to form a new substance, uh, the whole man, which then um, as terminating in the person of the word is a divine person, the person, um, or if not terminating in the word or in a divine person uh, entails a human person. Uh, so, so much for Constantinople three and Toledo 688. Uh, in the next lecture, we're gonna look at uh, some of the implications, the further or ulterior implications of Constantinople III with respect to uh, the theological metaphysics of the divinity ad intra and how uh, this distinction that develops between essence and energy and um, properties and energies uh, works out in terms of understanding God's eternal inaccessible essence versus his eternal uncreated energies on the one hand and how the uncreated energies um, through the appropriate admission of the spirit uh, come to interact with the created energies um, in the economy of salvation.